my hopes for our time together is just to have a conversation about dreams um, and kind of what got you interested in dreams and um, so much that you were able to dedicate so much time um, and energy to working with dreams throughout your career. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess my first question would be, what are your thoughts on why you've devoted so much time um, to studying dreams and working with dreams and writing about dreams? Okay. Uh, well, I first got interested in dreams when I was 15 in my high school, they assigned Freud's introductory lectures on psychoanalysis as summer reading. And that book has about a third of it is devoted to dreams. And I was just fascinated with Freud's ideas. And I immediately started to write down all of my dreams and do what Freud said to do, which was to write associations to every aspect of the dream. And, uh, so that's how I got started, and I've been writing down my dreams ever since. So at this point now, that's more than 50 years of dreams uh, that I have. And uh, so then when I went to college, I went to college at uh, the University of Chicago, and there was a professor there named Erica Fromm who only taught graduate courses, but she had just published a book on dreams with Thomas French at the Chicago Institute of Psychoanalysis. And she had a, uh, uh, several courses on dream interpretation. So I went to her and said, I'd really like to take your courses. And she said, oh, I've never had an undergraduate in one of my courses. And she really grilled me and uh, she eventually let me into her class. And so I learned from her and she had very strict ideas at the time. She, she thought she was quite radical compared to the Freudians that she worked with primarily. Um, so I learned from her, her approach to dreams, which uh, amplified what I was already doing. And I was at that point really, I was still writing my dreams down in longhand on pieces of paper, which I kept in a box. Uh, this was before computers came along. And uh, also at that time, there was a, a uh, researcher on dreams uh, at the University of Chicago named uh, Rechtschaffen, and uh, he had one of the first major laboratories about dreaming. So I went there figuring I could uh, work in that laboratory and do physiological research on dreams. Um, and he took me in, but it, in those days, to work in a sleep laboratory, uh, you had to basically stay up all night because everything had to be monitored you know the person who was being measured had an eeg and eog connected to his temples and you there had to be someone managing it making sure it all worked all through the night and monitoring what happened each time they went to a rem period and i'm very bad with jet lag so i did it for a while but i i just couldn't take the staying up all night and also doing full-time work as an undergraduate so I didn't stay there, but I got to know a lot of the people who were there. He had a graduate student um, named, I believe, Robert Watson or Thomas Watson, who was doing very interesting research that was kind of a crossover of the psychoanalytic approach to dreams and the physiological approach to dreams. Um, and actually, Erica Fromm was on his dissertation committee. She was very excited about it because Freud had said that uh, we dream in order to safeguard our sleep. And his study basically showed that the opposite was true, that we sleep in order to be able to dream and that the, the uh, costs of not dreaming are much worse than the costs of not sleeping. So should I just keep going? I mean, I can go through 50 years or do you want to ask me something more particular? Or? Keep going. <laughs> so I did that. Um, uh, let's see, where do we go from there? Well, then I, uh, I went, when I went to graduate school, I went to graduate school at Yale, and there wasn't a whole lot of work being done about dreams there, or at least that I came across, although I did work with a number of psychoanalysts and got to sort of refine my own ideas about dreams. Um, then I, well, then I did an internship 
at uh, Columbia at uh, the Psychiatric Institute. And there, um, I started working with patients. I actually had already started working with patients uh, when I was in graduate school. And patients told me dreams. And again, I just sort of did, mostly I did what Freud told us to do. And uh, I, I realized that very often a patient would tell me a dream and it told me something about the patient that he or she was just not telling me in any other way. So I started to realize how clinically important dreams were, not just because Freud said so, and not just because I was finding it interesting about myself, but I really found that it helped my clinical work. And I think it was then that I started to have, I started to develop my own approach to dreams, which was, uh, I, I'm a pretty concrete person. And so even though Freud said we had to look for the underlying meaning of the dream, the latent content, and basically ignore the manifest content of the dream, I was finding that I would, I would often say to a person, have you ever experienced what happened in the dream or something like it? And very often that brought up something that was really something the person had not spoken about before and that was probably the most anxiety-provoking aspect of the dream. So I did that just because it came naturally to me to do that. Um, then, let's see, I started my uh, private practice in 1977. So then I was really working quite a lot uh, with patients and with dreams. Uh, and one of the things that happened was when I was at Columbia during my internship, I had a supervisor there. Uh, I, I did a lot of work with psychotic patients uh, at Columbia because I was on the inpatient unit. But also, at that time, the Columbia Psychoanalytic, uh, if they would do intake interviews to get training cases. And if they interviewed somebody and decided that that person had a borderline personality disorder or a psychosis, they would not accept them as a training case. And this was right at the year that Kernberg arrived and that whole uh, diagnosis of borderline personality disorder really caught on. So when they got such a patient uh, who was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and they turned them down to be a second league training case, they sent them one floor down. I was on the eighth floor, they were on the ninth floor. They sent them to me. So I actually left that internship with a whole practice of people who had been diagnosed as borderline personality disorder by Columbia, which was a very challenging practice to uh, deal with. But so one of the first things that happened that really intrigued me with these patients is that I had had a supervisor at Columbia who said, the more crazy the patient, the more their dreams are crazy. And this wasn't happening. You know, I had this, you know, not a huge sample, but I don't remember how many people, a fairly large number of people. And very often the people who've been diagnosed as borderline would tell me a dream. And my reaction was, that doesn't sound like a dream. It sounds like something that happened. Whereas they would tell me things that happened that really sounded like a dream. You know, somebody might wake up and feel like their arm was on the other side of the bed or some kind of magical thing. And that turned out to be their waking experience. And the dream uh, often sounded much more ordinary. But also the dream still I saw told me things that the person couldn't tell me directly. So for one example, somebody um, was very anxious about starting treatment. In fact, I remember her first phone message to me was, I don't think I want to be in treatment. <laughs> so that was how we started the treatment. And, but she came in and in the second session, she told me a dream where the message was quite clear that she had felt very comfortable with me in the first session, that she cared a lot that I was writing notes and paying it very careful attention to what she was telling me. So that was a, a really interesting observation. I didn't know what to do with it, and I wasn't really publishing about dreams in those days. But then in 1979, I started psychoanalytic training at the William Allison White Institute in New York. And there we had a, a course, we had two courses on dream interpretation. One of them was with Lee Caligore, and one of them was with Paul Lippmann. And in that class, I mentioned 
just in passing that I had been observing this in with my borderline patients. And a member of my class said, oh, I've never heard that. You should write that up. So in fact, I ended up, that was my very first psychoanalytic paper. It was about, it, was, it, it came out in 1983 and it was called Changes in Dreams. Oh, because it, I, it was called Changes in Dreams of Borderline Patients because I noticed that as people got better, a lot of the psychotic material that was happening in their waking life started to get incorporated into their dreams. And so that was actually a very good sign that their dreams, the, the psychotic material was where it should be instead of where it had started out being. So that really got me launched into sort of a publishing about dreams and it got me some recognition. Um, I guess I can't remember all the conferences that I might have uh, presented at. Um, okay, so uh, then uh, I'm trying to remember. I, I got very involved with uh, the Association for the Study of Dreaming. I can't even remember now how I found them, but you know, I don't know if you've been to any of their meetings. They have it's an extraordinary group. They are an international group, and they meet somewhere, and they basically spend the whole conference discussing dreams, every possible school of dream interpretation and all the biological researches and dreams, everybody is there who's interested in dreams. So I went to that. Uh, one of the big important things for me at the Association of Study in Dreams was that there was a, one of the meetings was in Hawaii on the north coast of Oahu. Uh, and it said that uh, at 7.30 in the morning, a woman named Wendy Paneer was going to be leading a dream group. And I had never heard about dream groups. I thought, oh, this sounds interesting. So I went to it. And in fact, there were seven people whom I had never met before. And uh, one of them had just had a dream waking up that morning. So he told this group the dream. And uh, then Wendy Paneer led this dream group uh, the, through the, I don't know if you know Montague Ullman's approach to dream groups. I uh, read it in your book. <laughs> read it in my book. Oh, okay. Oh, so you've got my, my in the newest book, The Mind, Brain, and Dreams? Oh, great. Right. Yes. Well, yeah, I, so, so within an hour and three quarters, I found that this approach to dreams was the most profound I had ever come across. We had a deeper understanding of that person's dream than I had ever found. So I went up to her at the end of the meeting and she said, well, you know, Monty Ullman's in Ardsley and it's a suburb in, uh, in Westchester. It's about 20 minutes outside New York and he runs these marathon training weekends. Why don't you, you know, get in touch with him? So I did. I came back to New York and I went up to Ardsley for one of these marathon weekends. It really was extraordinary. You went there Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And from the minute you got there to the minute you left, you analyzed dreams. So I really got to learn uh, this whole approach very well. And I would say it just changed my way of working with dreams enormously. I would say it's still changing it. Um, is this okay? Should I say yeah. still hot? Or? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and so I, I did that and I really learned from Monty and I asked him, uh, well, you know, this is so amazing. How come this isn't taught in psychoanalytic training or in clinical psychology programs? It just seems like it's, it would be such a valuable thing. And he said, I don't know. I've been trying. You know, he's, he was going all around the world. He was very, very well known in Scandinavia where they love this approach. But the psychoanalysts were not really getting involved with it. So I can't remember somewhere around this time. Oh no, I'm sorry, that's not true. I actually started, I taught my first course about dreams in 1984. Sorry, I'm going backwards a little bit. <laughs> and that came from that, that article that I published in 1983. I sort of got known that as someone who worked with dreams. So I taught my first course in 1984, which by the way, I have to say, that first time was the most exciting time I've ever taught about dreams because I wasn't yet used to all the limitations that people had about how much they could read. So the reading list was just huge. I mean, we read all of the whole Freud interpretation of dreams, and then we read big swaths of Jung. We read so much, and I don't know, 
if everybody read everything, but a lot of the people in this first class really did read a lot, and you could tell in the class discussion, and it, w it was thrilling. So I was then teaching a class like that all the time, uh, every year. So then when I learned Monty Ullman's group approach, I thought, well, I'm gonna do this in one of my dream classes. And I mentioned it to one of my colleagues, and she said to me, oh, they're never gonna go along with it. Those psychoanalytic candidates, first of all, they're, they don't trust each other. No one's gonna tell somebody else their dream in front of those. And they're also so competitive, they just won't go with it. So I thought, well, I'm gonna try it. So the very first time that I tried it in one of the dream classes, I guess this colleague had made me so anxious that it must have gotten communicated. Nobody volunteered. So I said, well, then I'm gonna volunteer. So I presented one of my own dreams to the dream class and we worked on it. And then once they discovered how this thing worked and how phenomenal it is, all they wanted to, then they all suddenly wanted to present their own dreams. And the, I realized also that, you know, I, what, in my courses that I teach on dreams, each week we discuss half, we spend half the time discussing a reading and we spend half the time discussing a dream. And usually the students bring in a dream of one of their patients and, uh, which is fine. But what happened was once they learned this thing, this way of working with their own Dreams, they only want to bring in their own dreams. So it actually went quite the opposite of what my colleague said. And people just loved it. And I had to move that part of the course later and later so that I wouldn't I would be able to have some time where they were presenting their patient streaks. And then some people at the end of the class would say, This is really wonderful. Could we keep doing this? So then I started to run private dream groups. And I've been doing that now. I have one group that's been meeting for maybe 14 years and another one that's been meeting 12 years and people love it and it's and I, I have to say I love it too and I would say that doing that particular kind of work has changed the way I work with dreams even when I'm working in one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy or psychoanalysis because mm -hmm. it's made me having had so many experiences of presenting my own dreams in particular first of all it's made me very very sensitive to the level of anxiety that can be elicited by doing uh, something, a, a very intense interpretation. And if the person feels they have to respond, they can just basically leave the room. Uh, so I've learned very much how to use my own associations in a way that doesn't take over the process, but helps expand the process. So that's been a, probably a big change that I would say has happened over. 25, I've been doing this, the dream groups now for 25 years. Um, and you know, most of the time they are with mental health professionals, but just recently, uh, well, not so recent, three years ago, a woman named Alice Robb called me up. She was working on a book for the general public about dreams. I think it's called Why We Dream. And she came and interviewed me. And I, you know, I talked to her actually very similar to things that I've been telling you. But when I mentioned the dream group thing, she said, oh, could, uh, could I be in one of your dream groups? And I said, well, the dream groups themselves, you can't bring in somebody new because they're all very, they get used to each other. They don't let people come and go. I said, but if you can get seven of your friends to come, I'll do it. So she got seven people. All of them were in their 20s. And uh, none of them was in the mental health field. And uh, they came to my office and I ran a dream group. And they, so that was actually the first time I think I had run a dream group without any mental health professionals at myself being there. And it was interesting because it was different, but it was really just as effective. And they liked it so much, they continued to do it on their own for three years. And now she, had, she just wrote about it in this book, uh, her own experience of it. So. Oh, I've been talking a lot. Okay, so that I guess that brings us up to the present more or less. Oh, and so then also, though, you know, I was publishing quite a lot about dreams. And I would say one of the pivotal uh, papers that I wrote was in 1995. Um, I, uh, well, this is good. I had written a paper in 1992 called Working in the Counter-Transference. 
practice. And that also came out of all this experience of having a practice that was mostly borderline patients. And I found that some patients, when they, uh, uh, when they got very anxious, they didn't want to talk about themselves anymore. They would take the conversation and turn it into observations about me. And rather than fight it and see it as resistance, I started to realize, okay, we can talk about me. It's, you know, maybe that way they can talk about issues that are actually partly about them. They may also be true about me or not, but we can make some headway without their being too anxious. And after a while, talking about my psychodynamics, after they, if they might eventually say, you know, what we're talking about actually is really about me too. And so we often got very stuck treatments unstuck. So I, I wrote a paper about that. It got a, it, I, I presented a lot of places. And then I started to apply it to dreams because I realized that you know, people always thought the dream is mainly about the dreamer, which I do think it is mainly about the dreamer. But when people tell dreams in psychotherapy and in psychoanalysis, you very often the therapist or the analyst uh, can get insights from the patient's dreams about his or her own countertransference. And I was discovering that myself, a uh, number of cases. I have a lot of cases in that paper. And that was the most popular paper I've ever written. I presented in Budapest. I presented in, I don't know, all around the world and all around the country. And uh, people thought of it as radical. I, at the time, it just, you know, most of the things that I've written about dreams, they just sort of came to me and they became sort of part of what I did. But that paper in particular was considered radical and it became the basis for the way people who considered themselves relational psychoanalysts started to work with dreams. I got a little upset about it because it went from my saying in the paper that this was one thing you could do with dreams. People start, I started to hear that people were teaching it not just that it's something you could do, it's something you must do. And then it's hard to hear that they're saying that's the only thing you should do with dreams, which is never, never was my intention. So I guess in the latest book, I've sort of recanted something I never said, but just because it's sort of taken off that way. Um, but I presented that paper, I don't know how many times, but almost every single time that I presented it, uh, the first question was, well, what do you think about the analyst's dreams in which the patient appears? And what do you think about telling the, your dream to the patient? And my answer was, I had never done it. I had no knowledge about it. But I don't know, something about that paper elicited that question. And it happened so many times that I figured, well, I guess I better do it. How else am I going to be able to find out? So I did. I started it. I did it once. With the very first time I did it, I did it with a patient who the treatment was really stuck. I sort of was at wit's end about what was going on. So... Uh, I told him the dream and he was so interested in it. And then he replied the next session, he came in with a dream that kind of replied to my dream. And we said, there was this dialogue that went on about it and it really freed up the treatment and brought out some things that had never been talked about. So I did that. I probably, I don't know if I, how many times I've done it in my whole career, but probably not more than 10. But then I, in, then I, oh, so then I wrote a book in 2001 called The Dream Frontier. And uh, there was chapter 18 in that book was about that particular thing of telling a patient a dream. And that's been something else that I've developed. I still would say I'm very careful about it. Um, I, I don't do it regularly. Actually, I don't know how many times I have dreams where patients appear in the manifest content of the dream. Um, but I do it so. That's so great. <laughs> it's like, it kind of reminds, it, it sounds like a conversation between mind brains almost. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I'm so glad you read the mind brain book. Oh, that's, that is a whole other part I haven't, I didn't mention. Can I go on a little yeah. bit? More? So 20, it's about now, I guess it's 28 years ago. Um, there was a group at the New York Psychoanalytic uh, that got started called neuropsychoanalysis. 
and it was the intersection of neurology and psychoanalysis. And since actually from the back my days in Chicago with Rex Schaffen's lab, I had been very interested in that question. And I forgot to mention uh, when I was at graduate school, my PhD dissertation, even though I was trained in the clinical department, my PhD dissertation was involved with language and music perception and brain processes. So I still, I would say I've maintained that combination ever since I was in college. But when this neuropsychoanalysis group started, suddenly there was a critical group of people, really it was headed by Mark Solms and Jak Pongsev, who were the two leading figures, but I, went, I was there almost at the beginning and went to all of their meetings, and there was quite a lot that was going on about dreams, uh, especially because of Alan Hobson at Harvard. Uh, Alan Hobson, who was, is still a brilliant uh, physiological dream researcher, came up with a paper in 1978, you probably know, um, in, uh, in which he said that Freud was wrong, that uh, dreams were not caused by an unacceptable wish coming up during the middle of the night and the dream was being formed in order to allow the patient to stay, person, anyone to stay asleep, but that rather the dream was caused by a random stimulus that came from a very old part of the brain, the pons, and that this random stimulus then came up and the cortex would make up a story to out of this random visual stimulus. So it was a very interesting hypothesis. He had no data to prove it. And in fact, one could say he still doesn't have data to prove it, but it did allow the entire psychiatric and neurological and dream cognitive dream research world to suddenly say, oh, we, there is a whole different way we can look at this because Freud's idea had sort of just lasted for so long. And I have to say, I agree with Hobson that probably dreams are not necessarily caused by an unacceptable wish coming up during the night and, and that the dream disguises it. My own view is that dreams are actually not very disguised at all. I mean, that was came sort of, I guess if you read my book, you saw this idea of that, you know, of asking people, have they ever uh, experienced what happened in a dream or something like it? And then that something would actually come up like that. Um, but nevertheless, there was this huge debate that really went on, I would say, for 25 years between Mark Solms and Alan Hobson, because Solms had done a lot of work uh, looking looking at the dreams of people with different kinds of brain damage. And one of the things he found that really, I think, turned the tide against Hobson is that uh, people who had damage to their pons often still dreamt. And if Hobson's hypothesis had been right, that shouldn't have been the case. So uh, ultimately, he's, Hobson was probably not right. But nevertheless, I do think that uh, uh, that also, even though Hobson may not be right about how the dreams are formed, um, he probably, I think, is right that Freud's are that Freud's idea that dreams are disguised is also probably not true. So I've sort of developed my own view of dreams that out of that, and actually, even it's still going on. So you, if you read the Mind Brain and Dreams. I got close to, but didn't get to the, this idea that I finally realized this summer, after, you know, three months after the book came out, I almost, it's sad to say, but I wish I had waited, although, you know, you, with a book, you have to sort of at one point say, this is it. But I think there hasn't been enough attention to the evolution of dreams. I mean, it's very, very hard, maybe impossible to know for sure what. Uh, early forms of man or woman, person, uh, how they dreamt. But also, I think most people would agree that uh, before we had language, we probably were able to think. And there's a really, I think, a significant question. Well, how do you think before without language? And to me, if you look at dreams, most dreams... Uh, show you how you can think without language. I mean, you know, some dreams have some words in them, but mostly the ideas are expressed totally in terms of images and emotions. 
And to me, it seems like it would make sense that early forms of man, that is how they thought. They did represent the world in their mind imagistically, and they probably did have emotions before they had language. And so somehow I think that the pre-linguistic way that we had of thinking eventually somehow, and we don't know how, got moved into our dreaming processes as our linguistic ability started to take over more of our waking processes. That's my latest view about dreams. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> It's, I I started thinking of um, I started thinking of um, beyonds like beta and alpha elements and kind uh -huh. of starting to wondering starting to wonder about the connection between uh, mind brain uh, beta elements alpha elements and just and and this is totally a ta tangent but I have to go there <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but like I almost wonder if the evolution of language kind of restricted access to something for us as far as beta elements are concerned because there's just some things that you can't put into words um and you talked about that in mind brain a lot too just you really actually can't put things into words um yes that well that that's i'm glad you said that things i absolutely agree with you and i would say if we took the evolutionary perspective you could say that the way of thinking without words that may have been there uh, before we developed language continued to evolve so that even while we started to develop language, we also developed the way of thinking without language at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's very possible that that way of thinking shows up in dreams. And one of the things that makes dreams so valuable is that they can contain ideas that couldn't have been expressed in language. So what, when we get a person's dream, it's not that we have to interpret it, but we have to learn how to understand that, that nonverbal, imagistic, emotional language in its own terms. And if we do that, we may, you're, I absolutely agree with you that then you may find out things that the person is thinking that they haven't formulated in language and may have a lot of trouble formulating in language. Mm -hmm. I, in, my, in my first book, The Dream Frontier, I called it extra linguistic thinking. Yeah. At that time, I wanted to make the point that it's not pre-linguistic, it's something that just can't be expressed in words. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, and also I, it also brings up thoughts of like the of boluses, like the unthought known, and just um, I'm also thinking of like amygdala activation versus hippocampal activation, and how memory is stored in those different ways. Um, it, there's just so much to it. <laughs> right. That that that's true. I I I think I agree with you that the whole beyond approach to different ways of thinking is very important, but I, I'm, I am a little concerned at this point because what some of the Italian psychoanalysts are now doing with Beyond's theory is saying that there really is no difference between uh, working with a dream and working with what somebody says in their waking life in a session. And I think that actually misses the whole idea that there are some things that that can't be expressed or are not being expressed in their waking sessions um, and that will come through in a dream. Because otherwise, if you take that stance and this has happened, people will say, well then it doesn't matter whether you ever hear a dream from the night. Whatever you get in a dream from the night is something that you probably could get also from someone's waking communication. And by the way, in 1967, there was a group at the New York Psychoanalytic called the Chris Study Group. They spent two years studying this question of whether uh, there was something special you could get from dreams that you couldn't get from uh, the material of a, of a session. And um, unfortunately, at the end of two years, they published a monograph in, uh, from that study group that came to the conclusion that in fact, there was nothing special you could get from dreams. And they say Freud, when he wrote the interpretation of dreams, didn't know about free association. He hadn't discovered it yet, but we know about it. And so we don't need dreams anymore. And believe it or not, it's terrible, but I think it destroyed 
psychoanalysts, most psychoanalysts stop paying much attention to dreams. So in a way, you know, I don't, I, I was trained at the William Allison White Institute, but we pay more attention to dreams than most of the classical Freudians. They really, it was a terrible mistake, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it seems like it's missing out. I, I'm a student, I have no room to talk about this, but it just, it seems like it's missing out on something really, really important. Um, I, I think so. I mean, I just think, I don't think, I, I would say there are some, some psychoanalyses that I do where a person never tells me a dream. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can work without dreams, but if, if somebody tells me a dream, it often brings up things and so I think it's also, it sometimes brings up things that we end up working on through the whole analysis uh, and which things that might not have come up any other way. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's really one of the symptoms of this whole thing is every year there's a big conference in New York of the American Psychoanalytic Association. And three years ago, they organized a special study group on dreams. And it turned out for the last, the previous 20 years, there had been no special study group on dreams at a psychoanalytic organization. And I presented at that meeting and I thought, this is amazing that psychoanalysts had just basically ignored dreams for two decades on an institutional level. So, Wow. <laughs> I, it, huh. I'm also thinking too, just because like, the capacity to work with dreams um, and being well versed in working with dreams, I imagine, and it sounds like it informs um, general clinical practice as well, even if you're not working with dreams, just the way you think about interactions and the data, not data, but what's being presented in session. Um, yeah. I would say that's very true. I mean, that in a sense is what Freud tried to do in the chapter seven of the interpretation of dreams. He, he tried to take his observation on dreams and turn it into a whole theory about how the mind brain works. And I, I think a lot of it needs to be corrected, but you know, that was 130 years ago, uh, 120 years ago. And it, it was an extraordinary thing. And it's, it's basically, I think what every clinician in a way has to work out for themselves is how can I take what I learn from the dreaming processes uh, to understand the way the mind brain works. And in particular, I think you can do it for each individual because people's minds work differently. Mm -hmm. Some people have a tendency to have a certain way of dreaming that is in itself something that tells you about their psychology that is not the same as another person's way of having dreams. I mean, in a certain sense, I guess that was my first paper about border dreams and borderline patients was one example of that. But at this point now, I would say it goes on not just through diagnostic categories, but really even people's personalities or their defenses show up in dreams. And actually, I guess in the My Brain Dreams, I had a whole chapter about defenses in dreams, which that's another thing where, you know, um, blocking on her name, um, uh, Mariana Goldberger at the New York Second Lake wrote a paper in 1988 about defenses and dreams. It was a wonderful paper, but it was just about one or two defenses. And as far as I can tell, looking through the literature, since 1988 until the Mind, Brain, and Dreams came out, which is uh, 30 years people hadn't really looked at that question any further. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that tells you something about the field because I think it's important you get to see each person has a particular set of defenses that they use and it, you can find out what that set of defenses is by looking at their dreams. It's like, it's almost, or at least I'm taking it as um, being able to sit with someone else's dream um, and really talk it through with them, or, or not even, you don't even have to talk it through, you can just hold it and experience it with them. It feels like kind of the ultimate form of recognition, like Jessica Benjamin's like recognition. Um, yeah, and I mean, based on that, that her theory in general, that's just so essential to development. Um, and so I'd assume it's really essential to treatment as well.
It is. And I, when you say recognition, I agree. There is something about recognizing it. And one of the things that's wonderful about this Monty Ullman approach to dreams is that one of the things that you do, you hear a person's dream and then you associate to the dream as if it's your own dream. You speak in the first person. So it's really it's not only recognition, it's really trying to let yourself enter this person's world, this person's mental world. And you really do find yourself feeling what it's like to be somebody else much better when you do that. And in fact, sometimes in a dream group, people will say, you know, this is a dream I could have had. They feel like I recognize this way of being. And sometimes people say, I'd like to say if it were my dream, but I couldn't have this dream. I wouldn't have this dream. I would have it differently, which in itself tells you, you start to get the feeling about how these nonverbal ways of experiencing the world are very unique. Uh, they're not the same for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Do you think that, um, like by hearing other streams and, participating in exercises like that, that you get changed in the process as well. And I mean that in terms of um, like sitting with someone clinically and being curious about their experience and, let, and allowing them to give you feedback on yourself and thus change you. Um, I'm wondering if dreams have the ability to kind of facilitate that um, in a way. Yes, I think they do. I mean, in a certain way, I, maybe that's why that paper on getting insight into your own countertransference from your patient's dream was a way of saying operationally, yes, you can, a person in their dream expresses a lot about themselves, but that person who's in treatment with you is perceiving you. And they may be able to tell you something non-verbally most of the time about you that you don't see in yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself is a very valuable communication. Very often people will I think you find out things by doing clinical work. You do, you're mainly there to help the person, but along the way, you do discover things about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's, and sometimes until you do discover that thing about yourself, you can help the other person. Mm -hmm. um, that, by the way, was the idea of uh, Sandor Ferenczi, uh, you know, uh, the Hungarian psychoanalyst. Ferenczi was a very close colleague of Freud. But late in his life, in the early 30s, he, he, he had been known as when someone went for analysis in many places and it didn't help, he was the person who could help the people that nobody else was helping. And so he got to work some very difficult patients. And in the early 30s, he started to experiment with what he called mutual analysis because he had a patient who said to him, you have some kind of problems, and unless we get your problem worked out, we're not going to be able to fix my problems. And so he ended up with her having alternating sessions where she was the analyst in one session, he was the analyst in another session. It was so radical that he didn't publish it at that time. And he wrote these things in a clinical diary, uh, which didn't get published until the early, I think, earlier mid 1980s and it was first published in French I think and it didn't get published in English till 1988 and when that book came out it was unbelievable it, you know it was already 50 years more than 50 years later but we at the White Institute um, we the White Institute had been founded one of the people who founded it was um, um, Clara Thompson and she had gone to Budapest in the 30s to be analyzed by Ferenczi. So without spelling out his ideas, and she had never read the clinical diary, but she actually, her, she is one of the patients in the clinical diary we now know. She brought those ideas back to America and somehow they got imbued in a lot of the work of interpersonal psychoanalysts and then relational psychoanalysts. And so then in 1988, we suddenly found this book of Ferenczi that nobody had known about and realized, oh my God, he really had done this kind of research back then and he did it with Clara and somehow she brought it back. It's not even clear how much it was formulated in her mind or just imbued her own clinical work. And then she doing analyses here 
also change the way we all work. It's all interpersonal. <laughs> Eventually, yes. <laughs> and, you know, actually, that's another thing. You know, Jung, by the way, I, I mean, I, I think Jung is just, you can't really work with dreams unless you really understand Jung's ideas. And Jung, because of his feud with Freud or there may be other reasons, just a lot of the traditional psychoanalysts just excluded him. And so really the people at the Jungian Institutes study Jung, but people in regular traditional psychoanalysis tend not to. And I think that's a big mistake. And a lot of the most radical ideas that I've come to, really I've discovered Jung did them. So this idea of having a dream about a patient and telling the dream to the patient, apparently Jung did that all the time and he did it in such an easygoing way he would just say he's working with somebody and say, you know i happen to have a dream about you last night do you want to hear it and you know most of the time people would say yes but he never forced anybody to deal with his dream he just offered it to them and i think that was a that was really a lesson that i learned that uh, you know sometimes you tell the dream to the patient you think oh they're going to be so fascinated by this dream you had, and sometimes they just have no interest in it whatsoever. Or they don't want to talk about it. And I think if that happens, you leave, you leave it alone. It, no, nobody should be forced into it. But he was offering his psyche, including his dream psyche, to the patient as something that maybe they would want to use. Oh, so <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> um. And, and it's so interesting too, just like throughout our conversation, um, just listening to your story and the evolution of dreams in your own life um, and how that also kind of correlates with like dreams and how they've developed throughout the years too. Um, and I, I find myself wondering, um, do, you, do you believe that what initially got you interested in dreams is still what holds your interest in them or has that evolved throughout the years as well um it's very hard to say it certainly has evolved and actually when you just said what you did it made me aware that my own dreaming life uh has changed over my lifetime i'm now i'm now 68 years old and so actually if i were being if I really wanted to trace my interest in dreams, I would say that when I was, I'm not sure, three or four, mm -hmm. I had a repetitive dream and I was quite aware of it and I didn't know what to do with it. And it really wasn't until I started to do the Omen Dream Groups that I realized what that dream meant. So I feel like in actually, if I really want to answer honestly, what got me interested in dreams, the thing that got me interested in dreams, Freud got me interested in the dreams as a theoretical um, subject matter, but I guess the, what got me interested in dreams was this repetitive dream that I had as a child. Wow. And that actually really, it's, you know, if I look, I can look at now at my dreams from age, well, I have that one from a, being a child and I have dreams from age 15 on. And I would say just in the last year, uh, I don't know if it's because of age or something else, but I don't remember dreams as frequently. Maybe my sleep pattern has changed. That's very hard to say. But I would say it would be an interesting thing to, to do to trace the arc of all of your dreams, if you have a record of them from your whole life, and chart it maybe against what was going on in your life, what your life was like. So, for example, Freud had the idea that children's dreams are all just plain wish fulfillments there's not much there's there aren't complicated emotions it, 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 he, and he based it on examples from his own kids so there is a dream in the interpretation of dreams from Anna Freud she was a child and I guess they went and collected strawberries and she came home and she got sick and she was vomiting and they said you can't have any strawberries, you're sick. You can't eat these beautiful strawberries that we picked. So she woke up in the middle of the night dreaming 
something like Anna Freud strawberries pudding I don't you know something that basically said I want to eat those strawberries even though I can't get to them um, so I most people assume that Freud was right uh, but so <laughs> this is the thing that got carried over into my life is that uh, when I hear children tell a dream I'm there I'm writing it down so my one of my nephews we were on a family vacation and he was three and a half years old and he had a dream well he told it at breakfast but they said that what happened was before he had the dream he had uh, gotten up early in the morning and he was just walking around this hotel and he started singing really loudly at I don't remember what time it was exactly, but a lady came to her door and opened the door and started yelling at him. And he was really terrified by this experience. And that night, he had a dream in which a giant bumblebee was coming at him and, and you know, threatening to attack him, which I thought was a, it was clear from what happened, but it was not a wish fulfillment. It was actually a dream that both expressed anxiety and I thought for a three and a half year old it was a very amazing symbol to symbolize this woman as a giant bumblebee I mean in a certain sense I'm not sure because my nephew's grandmother who is my mother often referred to people who were arrogant as oh she thinks she's the queen bee I'm not sure if he ever heard that but I thought it when I heard his dream but I wrote that dream down with the date because I thought, you know, you never remember exactly when a dream was and you'll never remember the text of the dream. That's really one of the reasons it's important to write down dreams verbatim when you hear them. Um, so I have that written record and I can say at least for my nephew at age three and a half, Freud's theory did not apply and he was actually able to do some very complicated symbolization in his dream. So that's I think it's part of our idea about what is the development of cognition and what's the development of dreaming in relation to waking cognition that goes on from very early childhood until old age. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if um, I like it, it's amazing that he was able to symbolize that in the dream, right? And especially at three years old. And so I wonder if. Um, like dreams kind of function as uh, not only as play because that was anxiety coming out in the dream, but um, it's kind of like a, a practice of symbolizing. Uh, mm -hmm. And why, why I'm connecting that to play is because there's a lot of symbolization in play. Um, and I wonder if what gets us so fascinated with dreams from like, early on, because if I were to relate to my own experience, I would also say like, yeah, it was my dreams from when I was a kid that really got me interested in them. Um, but I wonder if it's like our desire to kind of keep that connection to play in a way. It could be. I mean, you could say that that's, that's one of those things. It's very hard to say which thing comes first. You could say uh, it is, we want to keep our connection to play, but play is actually a nonverbal way of thinking. We can act out things that we think and feel through play without ever putting them into words. So whether that particular way of thinking leads to that kind of dream or whether our dreams take us back into that way of thinking, I, I wouldn't know, but I absolutely agree with you that they are very closely related because very complex things can be represented without any words. There was no words in my nephew's dream. You know, she was a bee, bees don't talk. They just fly around and buzz. And I, you know, you could say that's how his way of representing that. And I should just mention what's really fascinating to me is that I published that dream in the Mind, Brain, and Dreams. And I, of course, had to ask my nephew for permission to publish it. And he said, sure. He said, but you know, I remember the incident with the woman at that resort. And I remember I was very upset about it, even after we came back to New York. But he said he didn't remember the dream at all. And that even reading it, he didn't remember having it. So that's really a reason that you want to write down those dreams. I mean, he couldn't write it down when he was three and a half, but I could. Why but it also, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it just says something also about the amnesia for dreams, that you can remember the whole complex of things that went around it, but the actual dream experience might get lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was my question, like, why does that happen? <laughs> I mean, who knows, but... <laughs> Well, you know, Freud, in, in the chapter seven, the interpretation of dreams, the very first part of chapter seven is called the forgetting of dreams. And he goes through the question of whether the dream is forgotten because it contains repressed material that is upsetting to the person. And so it gets pushed down again. Um, and that's been a subject of enormous debate ever since, which is, you know, 120 years now, because some people said that really isn't it, that the reason we forget dreams is that we have dreams when our brain, mind brains are in a different state. And so there is this loss of connection of the memory of the dream to the waking memory systems. You said that before about, you know, the different memory systems having to do with the amygdala and the the campus and in a certain sense that captures that particular approach to why dreams get forgotten but nobody has been able to prove why but everybody knows that it happens uh, so fascinating <laughs> um do you think that like so from your nephew's dream like it sounds like that dream has had a significant impact on you and your life and your view of dreams at least i would assume um, and like, I'm wondering if that's just a common experience or if I'm being way too assumptive with that. <laughs> a common experience? You mean for me or for people in general? That um, Both, why not? <laughs> well, I don't know people in general because, you know, my whole family, it was a large, a large group, was at the table when this happened. And I was the only one who said, my God, Lee's having a Lee's, This is Lee's first reported dream. I mean, I said to his mother, has he told you the other dreams before? She said, no. They weren't all very excited, you know. But he had this weird uncle who was interested in dreams and writing articles and books about them. So that, that's what happened there. Um, I would say also, though, there are big differences in cultures. Uh, and our culture tends not to, people don't talk about their dreams in general in our culture as much as they do in some other cultures. So I once had a study group on dreams and there was a woman there from Jamaica and she said, we would get up every morning and sit at breakfast and anyone who had a dream would tell their dream and the grandmother would tell everyone what that dream meant, not just for the dreamer, but for the whole family. She felt everybody's dreams were contributing to what the family should do. So, you know, when you take that stance, then suddenly dreams have an enormous meaning. And there is this idea that the grandmother, I guess, by virtue of her, her experience, has learned how to decipher something important for everybody. I wonder if that has to do with um, the grandmother specifically, like her role in the family as far as, um, like when I think of, lineage and grandparents they're they're kind of i feel like grandparents are more connected to grandchildren than those grandchildren are to their cousins um mm -hmm. at least that's the way i think of it and so i wonder if that kind of um connection contributes to that at all i'm just yeah <laughs> probably does i mean yeah i it, it depends though different families in different cultures grandparents have a different role mm -hmm. i mean in this particular culture, it sounded like the grandmother had an authoritative role. You know, there are some American cultures where the grandparents get sort of, you know, they're, they're not really so much in charge as they're being taken care of. But that, you know, the, the attitude towards elders is, can be very different if, in different cultures. Yeah. And I know that I, I went to China Okay, I, I went to China in 1997, which was, I was starting to work on the dream frontier at the time. Uh -huh. And so I was really interested in what their attitude towards dreams were. And it turned out one of our tour guides was a woman, she was, she was quite troubled. And she realized there were three psychoanalysts on this tour. And so she started to tell us her dreams. And I got to hear what the sort of, native Chinese approach to dreams is, which is 
in some ways quite different than the Western view. First of all, in terms of symbolism, the Chinese had very strict ideas about certain symbols. So red, if, if someone, she had a dream where there was a pile of blood and in the traditional Chinese approach, according to her, um, anything red is good luck. So if you have a dream about a pile of blood, it's good luck because it's red. And if you have a dream in which there is four of anything, that's very bad because the word for four is very close to the word for death. So almost all Chinese people know four is a very bad number. And eight in China is considered to be a wonderful number. When I was there, they told me there was a man in Hong Kong who had paid $2 million to get a license plate for his car that was 8888. Wow. And it's so precious. Everybody, nobody said, isn't this crazy he spent $2 million? All they said was, isn't it amazing he was able to get it? <laughs> we all would like a, a license plate with four eights because that is that would be great. So you, I think, you know, with each, there are some kind of universal symbols that are connected with bodily shapes. And I think, you know, bodily shapes are mostly the same in all cultures, mm -hmm. but there are also some very specific symbol systems that you really need to know in every culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's so amazing how cultural can influence the way we think about dreams so much. Do you think that, um, I mean, for me at least, just l listening to this and hearing this, I, I start thinking like if my patient brought in a dream to me, how now I would maybe hold back my associations a little bit more and try and bring in like, okay, what culture are they coming from? What does that mean for them? Um, and so I see dreams, the cult, I see that culture has an influence on not only the way the person interprets the dream, but the way that we interpret the dream as well, and then how we interact when talking about the dream. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I, I think, uh, oh gosh, I, I once had a student named Susan Bodner, who uh, she approached every psychotherapy as if she was an anthropologist. She thought every person's family was a culture, a unique culture, and she was going in as an anthropologist to find out how that particular culture worked. Uh, she had an enormous influence on me because it stayed with me. So what you just described, I think is true. I certainly would want to know, and that, that's, that's been a big question in the history of working with dreams is, how much do you go to what the person's associations are? And I think it's, it is very valuable to get what an individual's associations are, especially for things that are particular to their family culture. And at the same time, how do you let your mind go and have your own, pay attention to your own associations without taking over the person's dream? And that's one of the things, I, I mean, I can, I, we could discuss, you know, 100 years of papers on dreams. There are examples of people who do what I call hijacking the patient's dream. They hear the patient's dream and they come up with their own associations and they get so caught up with their own associations that they sort of take over what the person's dream is. There's an example in Freud, even Freud has an example of a patient who has a dream which he calls, Freud calls it, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, the, the patient has a, an association to the dream to a particular German poet. Freud has an association to the dream uh, to the poet Sappho. And before you know it, you get to the end of the dream and Freud is calling it my patient Sappho dream. The patient never thought of Sappho. And actually, you can hear Freud comes up with his association. The patient comes up with his own, and Freud sort of ignores them. Now, I think all, you know, it'd be very easy to say, oh, wow, Freud, how can you do that? I think any clinician could do that at any time. You know, you, you, it really captures that keeping that kind of balance of paying attention to what you think, but not hijacking the patient's dream. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah. And I wonder if, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of intersubjectivity now and um, like the space of the analytic third. And I wonder if, well, I mean, I would assume, yeah, that with sitting with different analysts, the different meanings kind of come out of the dream. Um, because I'm kind of viewing the dream now as uh, as a, this manifestation of, of this third, um, because the same associations wouldn't happen if you were sitting with a different person. Well, yes, that's true. I actually, I have a, I have a little data on this. It's not formal <laughs> data, but because I have, you know, in my dream groups, a lot of the people either have been or are currently in individual analyses. So I have had people who have said, I brought this dream into my analysis and this is what, they usually don't tell us what the, they came up with their analysts first. They just bring us the dream and we as a group of seven or eight people work on the dream. And I would say almost always they say, wow, you know, I and my analyst, one other person who knows me very well, still all we came up with was with this much meaning and now I feel like I know this much more meaning and then they might say, what is it about my personality and my analyst personality that we only saw this part and not these other parts? And sometimes they actually go back to their individual treatment and say, I discussed this dream with a group and we came up with these other meanings. And some of the meanings have to do with my relationship with you. What do you think? And it becomes a kind of interaction between the group approach and the individual treatment approach. Yeah. I probably should do that, collect that systematically. It would be, it, it would be a, an interesting study to do. I would read it. <laughs> I'd like you to write it. I, like, I really need graduate students. I have all these ideas, but I, I don't have the thing to set up to, to get them done. I'm there. Like I said, I have <laughs> in Connecticut, New Haven, two-hour train ride there. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so I guess too, I, I'm wondering, because there's so much we don't know about dreams, um, and that's always like on the outskirts of all the different things we've been talking about. Um, what do you think stands out the most to you about like what puzzles you the most about dreams? What puzzles me the most about dreams? That's an excellent question. Well, it's such a good question that I probably, I probably want to think about it for a long time and I probably could come up with hours of answers. <laughs> one, big, one big question I have is, we know that everybody dreams at least five or six times a night. Uh, that's at least REM dreams and you know, the, the non-REM dreams. So, and most people don't remember most of those dreams. So a big question for me is what happens with those dreams that we don't remember? How is there a function that those dreams have for our daily lives without our being aware ever consciously of the dream? And that we, I think if there are a number of approaches we could take to studying that, one of them is I actually find that sometimes when I'm working with someone clinically in a treatment and we're just talking about something, they suddenly, from what we're talking about, say, oh, I just remembered a dream I had. They had no conscious awareness of that dream until that moment. So clearly something about what we were discussing is an ongoing concern somewhere for them, probably mostly unconsciously, somehow we tapped into that theme and it just brought the dream into awareness and maybe you know I don't know if we could say that that person might never have remembered that dream uh, otherwise mm -hmm. so that I would say is that if we could answer that and I would say that you know we used to think we're never going to be able to really study dreams as they're happening um, in my first book, I said there is no study. The closest we have is there's a science fiction movie at that time called Brainstorm, 
where they connect this old style computer into someone's head and you could actually see on the screen the dream that they were dreaming. And I thought, well, that's great. It wouldn't be great if we could do it. But now there is a group of Japanese researchers who actually have been able to figure out from people's brain waves what content they are thinking about. They first did it with waking thought. They could tell the actual objects that someone was thinking about. And now they published a study of doing that with someone's dreams while they're dreaming. So I think, you know, probably certainly in your lifetime, we're going to be able to actually know what somebody's dreaming in the moment that they're dreaming it, which I think will change our whole understanding of dreams. Because we're going to be able to do incredible kinds of research. Do you think there's, this kind of just came to me, but do you think there's intentionality in our mind brains to keep the like dreams and their mechanisms and ways of working and their meaning so ambiguous to our like conscious self? Well, that's, that is what, that actually is another really big question that is it, how much is it motivated and how much is it just there are different parts of the mind brain operating and they just operate separately and they may there may not be a reason for keeping them separate but they just have evolved separately and so we have different parts coming up with different ways of representing ideas and i would say i don't know that we have enough data to say anything in a general way I can't say, I mean, I see it in my clinical practice, some things like that happen. So, for example, I think it's in the book of my brain dreams, I'm not sure. I once had a patient who had a dream, and I don't know, three months after she told me the dream, by the way, first of all, I write down, not only do I write down all my patient's dreams, but I then transcribe them into my computer. So I really, somehow the process of transcribing into a computer, I often get insights, but I also then have a real record of everybody's dreams. So I think three months after she had the dream, I made a reference to this dream that she had, and it ended up, she was swimming out to sea to save somebody, and then when she got there, she took a potter, piece of pottery and smashed the person over the head and killed them instead of saving him. So I said something about that. She said, I never had that dream must be mixing me up with somebody else which by the way you know when you get older you start to really get scared when somebody says that it hasn't happened yet unfortunately i can look them up i haven't mixed up anybody you know so i said well no don't you remember the dream started she remembered the beginning of the dream she remembered the middle of the dream but she she did not remember that it ended with her killing the person and she she had actually written the dream down herself so she went back to her and said there it was so there was an example of total repression of just one part of the dream. Now you could say, you know, Freud would say that's motivated. There was something about that, the aggression part. You know, the dream portrayer first is trying to save somebody and then killing somebody and say that she found the part of herself that wanted to kill somebody unacceptable. So she just filtered that out and re retained the other part. Mm -hmm. I, it's not absolutely certain that that's what happened, but you know, if you could come up with a study about p how pieces get repressed, how they come up, you know, what's so interesting about that kind of repression is she looked it up and she saw it and she felt, oh, I guess I wrote it down. That must be part of my dream. But even then, she didn't have the feeling of remembering it. She didn't say aha, now I remember that that's how the dream ended. She felt like it feels completely foreign to me. So that is really repression of an extraordinary kind. Yeah. Um, but it's so tempting to just assume that there is a motivation. And, you know, most psychoanalysts can come up with a motivation, that, but I'm not sure that it, that is always the cause of the repression. I, I started thinking of... Um shame so like initially um saying what the dream was and writing it down um and i almost wonder if by carrying that process out the mind brain was like oh wait too shameful let's forget that that ever happened <laughs> that's, that's kind of what i started thinking of 
It could be. I mean, and people do some, you know, when people are telling you a dream, sometimes they, le they consciously say, I'm not going to tell them that part of the dream. Then you, they feel, you know, that's, that's too shameful. I don't want to, I don't want to tell you that. Um, but see, now that's something it would, ex it's a plausible explanation that it was shame, but I'm, I, I don't know that I could prove it. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, that when you said what is so interesting about dreams, I feel like dreams give us a chance to prove some of these very, or to test some of these very basic ideas that we have about how the mind brain works and how personality works and how defenses work and how memory works and forgetting works. I mean, they're just, they're just very vivid examples of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how we are creative. I mean, my God, that's one of the most important things, you know, that, I mean, one of my, my theory that I came up in the dream frontier of what happens with the dreams that we have, but we don't remember is that even though we don't remember them somewhere, they get registered. And a lot of times dreams produce something that's a really new idea or a new creation. And maybe there's something like what I call oneric Darwinism, which is that the idea somehow gets you incorporated into the mind brain. And if it's useful, we may keep it. And we may actually think in our waking life, oh, I just had this inspiration when it's actually something that came up in a dream. And there may be, you know, the ideas that come up that are not useful, we just throw them away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's this whole big world that lives inside of us, and that kind of gives us a glimpse of what's in there <laughs> every, every right. time, again, <laughs> time to time. It's like, hey, look, you can do this, but just kidding, I'm going to repress that now. <laughs> there's another, I would say there's a, actually, God, there's so many really big questions that I, mm -hmm. I feel like the dreams bring up. What a really interesting one is, there's an example in Freud's interpretation of dreams, he actually read a French writer on dreams named Maury. Uh, Maury had a dream in which um, he comes up. I forget exactly. I think he gets on trial. They sentence him to death. There's a long march over hills and through a very complicated landscape to the guillotine. And then he puts his head on the guillotine and they pull the cord or whatever. And he wakes up. And when he wakes up, uh, he the the headboard of his bed fell on his head so marie says i think the instigation for this dream was this headboard falling on my head felt like i was having my head chopped off in a guillotine but how did i have this long pream preamble to going to the guillotine if i got if i got this dream was brought up by this thing falling on my head. So his, the, that is one of the ways Freud came up with the idea of unconscious fantasies, is that his idea was that actually the dream didn't occur in real time, but maybe the thing fell on my head. And then I had this whole long drama as a kind of stored unconscious fantasy. And when I woke up from the dream and remembered the dream, I wasn't actually remembering a dream that had gone on for minutes, but was just already there, stored up. And I feel like now that we have computers, there's a kind of computer analog of this. You know, you have a YouTube podcast. You could say we have certain kinds of YouTube videos stored up in our mind brain, and that when the dream happens, sometimes, not always, because we do know that a lot of dreams are dreamt in real time, but maybe sometimes the dream will be like, a momentary experience of an entire video that we have stored as an unconscious fantasy in our mind. Yeah. And I wonder how much those videos are um, kind of representations of, well, I mean, they are different representations of life and that's part of dream interpretation um, as representations of those movies, those internal movies. Yeah. Well, you could say, I mean, you could say some of them are, some version of memory mm -hmm. that they are transformed memories you know all of, we there is that def, i think it's pretty well established at this point that memory is not a big box that holds things as permanent films 
but they're constantly being retranscribed. And you could say that some of these dreams are showing the retranscription of early memories. Um, that happens. That's actually another area of dreams that really is fascinating to me is people who have been traumatized very early in their life and sometimes do not have actual memory of the trauma, although people in their families know what happened to them. So they, it's, and, and sometimes things come up in dreams that show that somewhere that traumatic experience got registered. So there's a wonderful example of that. There's a man named Niederland who had a patient who had a dream, I'm trying to, I don't know, in the dream, he was freezing. I, I, he was shivering. I don't remember the whole dream, but there was something about he was lying in a crib and he was shivering. And so he told the dream to his analyst, and his analyst said, well, uh, did that ever happen to you? And he went, the patient went and told his parents that he had had this dream. And they were horrified because they said when he was very young, I don't know, maybe six months, some, I don't remember exactly, when he was very young, there was one time by mistake in the middle of winter, they had left the window open and the room that this child was in got extremely cold and he got sick and they never told him about it and he recovered, but they remembered that it happened and somehow, even though he had no direct memory of the experience, it showed up literally in the dream. Wow. <laughs> I wonder if that's part of what fascinates us about dreams too, is um, holding on to memories that we can't consciously hold. Yes, I, I think so. And that sense of sort of knowing, not really knowing, but you have a sense, wow, if I'm having that dream, something about the whole feeling of that dream feels close to me enough that it fascinates me, but I can't really access the thing itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, and I wonder if some people are, are more likely than others to um, be in touch with that sense, like the sense of, okay, there's something, I don't know what it is. I don't have words for it. I have this experience of it. And then I wonder if those are the people that are more inclined to turn to like dreams and be like, okay, is this a way for me to gain access to this thing that I don't know about? Sometimes I think that's true. Sometimes, I mean, I may, when I'm working with people, sometimes they come to that themselves and sometimes I may make a connection and there's anything from, oh yeah, that's really fascinating to, oh, come on, that's not so. I mean, I have to say that it is a constantly fascinating really sometimes thrilling experience to watch people's defenses, um, watch their repression. I mean, I once had someone who had a dream and I thought hearing that dream felt very clear to me that there was some really terrible thing that happened between his parents. And he could appreciate the symbols, he could appreciate that it looked mysterious, but he said, I don't know of anything like that. And then, Somewhat later, I just remember there was a moment when something that had come up early in the treatment, this person completely forgot about it. And when I brought it up, he, not, he said to me, I have no memory of that whatsoever. And I just want you to know that if I didn't feel like I knew you better, I would think that right now you're making this up and you're trying to convince me of something that it never happened. That's how much I feel like this is not part of me. Wow. So, you know, they're, they're just when you see that, you go, whoa, those, you know, those defenses are really phenomenal sometimes. You don't always see it that strongly, but when you see it, you go, what's going on? And how did we evolve to be able to do that, to really get rid of, I mean, I think Freud you know, came up Freud, he really talked a lot about repression and people have argued that it's not as ubiquitous as he said. And I think it's probably true. It's not as ubiquitous and it's also not always as extreme. But when you see it, you know, it happens in that moment. 
<laughs> that, that's it right there <laughs> uh, I mean even in the language too it's just it's just in hearing like it wasn't me like it's me versus not me language even in the description of the dream or the uh -huh. description of the experience um, well that's true too that that's another very important aspect of the dreams is the way people experience them like they how much they own the dream as part of themselves versus something outside of them. Jung actually was really the genius about that because Jung had two approaches to dreams. I feel about this. That he had the objective approach and the subjective approach. Mm -hmm. He said the objective approach, everyone in the dream is who they are. So it's your mother, your father, your wife, your husband, your friend, whatever, they are who they are. But in the subject approach to the dream, everyone in the dream is an aspect of the dreamer. So he felt that, you know, if it's your mother in the dream, it's also part of you. So, and the Jungians feel that the most difficult thing about working with dreams is to, to own all the different aspects, all the characters in the dream as parts of yourself. So if you have a dream where someone's chasing after you with a machete mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to kill you or something like that, the Jungians would say, there's some part of you that's a killer and you know people say oh what do you mean i'm the victim i'm the person running away i was trying to get away from that awful person and it's really hard to say oh how is that part of me too mm -hmm. yeah and that's when you blame the mind brain you say no the mind <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> <People do it. laughs> but we would have we have that what's that expression we say my mind's playing tricks on me yeah exactly. it's, just a, it's just a weird thing to who, who who's who's mind what are you talking about <laughs> and who's the me that it's playing tricks on yeah. i mean in a certain sense you could say that about every dream in the dream there's a part of us that's watching the dream or experiencing the dream and then you know there's a part of us that's making the dream and we don't usually pull those together mm -hmm. What would happen, or and what does happen when we do pull those together? Well, that's that's the big question. You know, some people say, "Well, you become very anxious." I mean, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you represented somebody what, running after another person with a machete, mm -hmm. you start to think, "Oh my God, that's me." You could feel anxious. I guess you could feel shame, you could feel guilt, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Yeah, or you just go into psychology. <laughs> <laughs> career out of it that's true that's probably that's probably true you know i had that early repetitive dream and here i am <laughs> it becomes my whole life <laughs> my uh my very first psychology class in undergrad my um professor said to us let's just admit it right now right this second the reason why we're all here is because we're all messed up and we want to know why and i was sitting there like yeah i guess i gotta own that <laughs> <laughs> But even then it becomes, you know, that's when you ask about my lifespan, it evolves though. You could say maybe that is the original motivation, but after a while it starts to develop all this kind of intellectual fascination. And mm -hmm. then also you start to feel like, whoa, it's not just about me. I'm suddenly, I have the privilege of entering other people's lives and really, you could still say maybe it helps me understand myself, but it really does help other people. Amazingly wonderful feeling when you can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I, I mean for me at least, and, that, and maybe this is your experience too. But that's part of why I've become increasingly interested in dreams is just the way it allows for connection to develop between two people. Uh huh. It's it's so interesting you say that because you know Freud said originally in the interpretation of dreams he said dreams are not meant to communicate. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Ferenczi came along and said, well, maybe, maybe they are. <laughs> uh, although it's interesting, in the clinical diary, even when he has, uh, he's doing mutual analysis, there are no examples of him having a dream about his patient and, his dream, it's, and him telling the dream to the patient. You know, when I started working on that, I thought, oh, I bet it's in the clinical diary of Ferenczi, but it's not. Uh, maybe I don't, I wouldn't swear he never did it, but maybe, maybe he didn't, or maybe he thought even, that's even too radical for me to put down in my private diary. I don't know. 
<laughs> I'm going to have to go. I'm realizing I'm getting close to time now. So this has been wonderful. I'm very, I really appreciate you. Yes. Thank you so, so much for taking the time out to talk with me and for dealing with Adobe <laughs> and the consent form and all that good stuff. <laughs> so when is your dissertation going to be done, would you say? Or? My goal is, to, so I'm in my third year right now, um, and my goal is to have it done before internship applications. So I plan on really writing everything up and getting things together over the summer. Um, so hopefully- Rick, Can I get a copy when you have it done? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, and I can send you a copy of the video and recording and yeah. All right, that'd be great. I appreciate that too. Yes, of course. Um, and if you have any more questions, feel free to email me. I mean, if there's something to follow up on, I'll be glad to do it. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so, so much.